The Ballad of Reading Jail In memoriam, C.T.W., sometime trooper of the Royal Horse Guards, Obit H.M. Prison, Reading, Berkshire, July 7, 1896. 1. He did not wear his scarlet coat, for blood and wine are red, and blood and wine were on his hands when they found him with a dead, the poor dead woman whom he loved and murdered in her bed. He walked amongst the trial men in a suit of shabby grey, a cricket cap was on his head, and his step seemed light and gay, but I never saw a man who looked so wistfully at the day. I never saw a man who looked with such a wistful eye upon that little tent of blue which prisoners call the sky, and at every drifting cloud that went with sails of silver by. I walked, with other souls in pain, within another ring, and was wondering if the man had done a great or little thing, when a voice behind me whispered low, that fellow's got to swing. Dear Christ, the very prison walls suddenly seemed to reel, and the sky above my head became like a cask of scorching steel, and, though I was a soul in pain, my pain I could not feel. I only knew what hunted thought quickened his step and why he looked upon the garish day with such a wistful eye. The man had killed the thing he loved, and so he had to die. Yet each man kills the thing he loves, by each let this be heard. Some do it with a bitter look, some with a flattering word. The coward does it with a kiss, the brave man with a sword. Some kill their love when they are young, and some when they are old. Some strangle with the hands of lust, some with the hands of gold. The kindest use a knife, because the dead so soon grow cold. Some love too little, some too long. Some sell, and others buy. Some do the deed with many tears, and some without a sigh. For each man kills the thing he loves, yet each man does not die. He does not die a death of shame on a day of dark disgrace, nor have a noose about his neck, nor a cloth upon his face, nor drop feet foremost through the floor into an empty space. He does not sit with silent men who watch him night and day, who watch him when he tries to weep and when he tries to pray, who watch him lest himself should rob the prison of its prey. He does not wake at dawn to see dread figures throng his room, the shivering chaplain robed in white, the sheriff stern with gloom, and the governor all in shiny black with a yellow face of doom. He does not rise in piteous haste to put on convict clothes, while some coarse-mouthed doctor gloats and notes each new and nerve-twitched pose, fingering a watch whose little ticks are like horrible hammer-blows. He does not know that sickening thirst that sands one's throat before the hangman with his gardener's gloves slips through the padded door and binds one with three leathern thongs, that the throat may thirst no more. He does not bend his head to hear the burial office read, nor, while the terror of his soul tells him he is not dead, cross his own coffin as he moves into the hideous shed. He does not stare upon the air through a little roof of glass, he does not pray with lips of clay for his agony to pass, nor feel upon his shuddering cheek the kiss of Caiaphas. 2. 
Six weeks our guardman walked the yard, in a suit of shabby grey. His cricket cap was on his head, his steep was light and gay. But I never saw a man who looked so wistfully at the day. I never saw a man who looked with such a wistful eye upon that little tent of blue which prisoners call the sky, and at every wandering cloud that trailed its raveled fleeces by. He did not wring his hands as do those witless men who dare to try and rear the changeling hope in the cave of black despair. He only looked upon the sun and drank the morning air. He did not wring his hands, nor weep, nor did he peek or pine, but he drank the air as though it held some healthful anodyne. With open mouth he drank the sun as though it had been wine. And I, and all the souls in pain who tramped the other ring, forgot if we ourselves had done a great or little thing, and watched with gaze of dull amaze the man who had to swing. And stranger it was to see him pass with a step so light and gay, and stranger it was to see him look so wistfully at the day, and stranger it was to think that he had such a debt to pay. For oak and elm have pleasant leaves that in the springtime shoot, but grim to see is the gallows-tree with its adder-bitten root, and, green or dry, a man must die before it bears its fruit. The loftiest place is that seat of grace from which all worldlings try, but who would stand in hempen band upon a scaffold high and through a murderer's collar take his last look at the sky? It is sweet to dance to violins when love and life are fair. To dance to flutes, to dance to lutes, is delicate and rare. But it is not sweet with nimble feet to dance upon the air. So with curious eyes and sick surmise we watched him day by day, and wondered if each of us would end the selfsame way, for none of us can tell to what Red hell his sightless soul may stray. At last the dead man walked no more amongst the trial men, And I knew that he was standing up in the black dock's dreadful pen, And that never would I see his face in God's sweet world again. Like two doomed ships that pass in a storm we had crossed each other's way, But we made no sign, we said no word, we had no word to say. For we did not meet in the holy night, but in the shameful day. A prison wall was round us both. Two outcast men we were. The world had thrust us from its heart, and God from out his care. And the iron gin that waits for sin had caught us in its snare. 3. In debtor's yard... The stones are hard, and the dripping wall is high. So it was there he took the air beneath the leaden sky, And by each side a warder walked, for fear the man might die. Or else he sat with those who watched his anguish night and day, Who watched him when he rose to weep, and when he crouched to pray, Who watched him lest himself should rob their scaffold of its prey. The governor was strong upon the Regulations Act. The doctors said that death was but a scientific fact. And twice a day the chaplain called, and left a little tract. And twice a day he smoked his pipe and drank his quart of beer. His soul was resolute, and had no hiding place for fear. He often said that he was glad the hangman's hands were near. But why he said so strange a thing no warder dared to ask. For he, to whom a watcher's doom is given as his task, Must set a lock upon his lips, and make his face a mask. Or else he might be moved, and try to comfort or console. And what should human pity do, pent up in murderer's hole? What word of grace 
in such a place could help a brother's soul. With slouch and swing, around the ring we trod the fool's parade. We did not care. We knew we were the devil's own brigade. And shaven head and feet of lead make a merry masquerade. We tore the terry rope to shreds with blunt and bleeding nails. We rubbed the doors and scrubbed the floors and cleaned the shining rails. And rank by rank we soaped the plank and clattered with the pails. We sewed the sacks, we broke the stones, we turned the dusty drill, we banged the tins and bawled the hems and sweated on the mill. But in the heart of every man terror was lying still. So still it lay that every day crawled like a weed-clogged wave, and we forgot the bitter lot that waits for fool and knave. Till once, as we tramped in from work, we passed an open grave. With yawning mouth the yellow hole gaped for a living thing. The very mud cried out for blood to the thirsty asphalt ring. And we knew that ere one dawn grew fair, some prisoner had to swing. Right in we went, with sole intent on death and dread and doom. The hangman, with his little bag, went shuffling through the gloom, and each man trembled as he crept into his numbered tomb. That night the empty corridors were full of forms of fear, and up and down the iron town stole feet we could not hear, and through the bars that hide the stars white faces seemed to peer. He lay as one who lies and dreams in a pleasant meadow land. The watchers watched him as he slept, and could not understand how one could sleep so sweet a sleep with a hangman close at hand. But there is no sleep when men must weep who never yet have wept. So we, the fool, the fraud, the knave, the endless vigil kept, and through each brain, on hands of pain, another's terror crept. Alas, it is a fearful thing to feel another's guilt. For, right within, the word of sin pierced to its poisoned hilt, and as molten lead were the tears we shed for the blood we had not spilt. The warders, with their shoes of felt, crept by each padlocked door, and peeped, and saw, with eyes of awe, gray figures on the floor, and wondered why men knelt to pray who never prayed before. All through the night we knelt and prayed, mad mourners of a course. The trembled plumes of midnight were the plumes upon a hearse, and bitter wine upon a sponge was the savior of remorse. The gray cock crew, the red cock crew, but never came the day, and crooked shapes of terror crouched, in the corners where we lay, and each evil sprite that walks by night before us seemed to play. They glided past, oh, they glided fast, like travellers through a mist. They mocked the moon in a rigadoon of delicate turn and twist, and with formal pace and loathsome grace the phantoms kept their tryst. With mop and mow, we saw them go, slim shadows, hand in hand. About, about, in ghostly rout, they trod a saraband, and the dampened grotesques made arabesques, like the wind upon the sand. With pirouettes of marionettes they tripped on a pointed tread, but with flutes of fear they filled the ear as their grisly mask they led. And loud they sang, and long they sang, For they sang to wake the dead. Oh, they cried, the world is wide, But fettered limbs go lame, And once or twice to throw the dice Is a gentlemanly game. 
but he does not win who plays with sin in the secret 